Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tim Golden, uh, founder of ComplianceRisk.io, and we have our friends from CompTIA here, Wayne, today, talking about all the fun stuff, the CTA and the buzzwords that we all keep hearing around the interwebs. Uh, anyways, Wayne, why don't you take a couple seconds and do a little intro. Tell us who, what, where, when, how, why. Hi, everyone. My name's Wayne. I'm a recovering cybersecurity practitioner. <laughs> Aren't we all right? Know, I know, right? <laughs> um, I have, oh my God, I was just calculating it the other day. A lot of experience. Let's just put it that way, right? Because I really don't want to age myself. Although I will, I will share publicly, I do have a couple of grandkids that are above uh, months old, right? So um, I, I, I've been around a very long time. Um, most recently, prior to CompTIA, you may have recognized me from Senior Director of Cybersecurity Initiatives at ConnectWise. Uh, our company was acquired in November of 2018 by ConnectWise. We were known as Sienna Group. Um, we were led by Mr. John Ford and a couple of other uh, folks, uh, including myself. Um, we are a niche GRC governance risk compliance organization, right? Nice. Um, so <clears throat> we know we know about those acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> he says yeah. the dyslexic guy, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so yeah, no. Um, I I actually started cutting my chops in technology back in wow. Uh, I think I was in fifth grade, sixth grade when I acquired a Commodore sixty four. Um, Love Right, because my dad actually worked for the phone company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was one of the, we were one of the very first households to actually have a cradle modem. Yep. In our house. Yep. Uh, so it was kind of interesting. Uh, anyway. So in uh, little, you know, Timbuktu, uh, Epping, New Hampshire, I ran a BBS over one of those, you know, uh, was it a monochrome monitor back then? It was that yeah. ugly looking green, like really hard. That's probably why I wear glasses now, right? So I'm right there with you. And even, even like we were so excited as things progressed and we went up to, oh my gosh, V90, like that was the thing, right? 56K was dead and V90 was the, oh my gosh, we can yeah. do stuff on the internet. And I'm going to upload my 320 by 480 picture to my little GeoCities website, and it's going to take me four hours, but I'm going to have a picture on there, damn it. <laughs> right. Or uh, needing to download uh, Zoom or get the updates where it took overnight for everything. <laughs> it took overnight. Yeah. We won't talk about what was it, LimeWire Networks or some of those other things that might have been out there that were just awful for us and talk about security risk, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yes. a, li a little bit of housekeeping. Um, yeah, I hate Zoom when it disables the chat. So there's the Q&A feature. If y'all have questions, put them in there and I'll be sure to ignore them along the way while I'm trying to do multi multiple things. No, we'll answer your questions as we're going along. We're really hoping that we can get some feedback from the MSPs here. I see a lot of great people, Kevin, John, Jim, James, Tom, and the list goes on and on and on. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We're pretty excited to have Wayne here. Wayne, I like to kick it off with just a little question, a little personal anecdote. Like, if you could meet one human ever in the history of time, who would it be and why? Wow, you know, that's uh, never been asked. <laughs> I'm, I'm, Put I'm, you on the spot. If, if I could go back in time, uh, and it's not that far i i would really like to meet queen elizabeth oh, right the, the, the second right uh who just passed not that long ago <clears throat> i did have the uh pleasure of being able to go to london last year and actually visit um her graveside right after she was interred but um wow. but i i actually just find it fascinating that this young woman um, who grew up, never thought, uh, you know, she would be queen, uh, literally, mm -hmm. right? Um, after her uncle abdicated, her dad ended up becoming king. Uh, and then, wow, she was thrust into the spotlight after uh, he passed. But um, at, at a very young age, by the way. Um, and, and there was a lot of things that she needed to learn and understand, uh, which she didn't have time. Normally, there's a plan 
mm -hmm. uh, to, to help get individuals uh, in the royal family up to speed before they actually have to take over for their royal duties. Um, anyway, I, I just like everything about her. Um, mm -hmm. She seems so witty, so charming, um, very well put together, very <clears throat> intelligent uh, and Oh my goodness sakes. I, I just wanted to pick her brain and go, I mean, was, was this what you imagined? That kind of thing. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, you make some interesting intersections there, right? So for me, I've obviously given this thought because I asked the question a lot. For me, it would be Lincoln. Um, I just, you know, the man fascinated me on how much he could say with very little number of words. Right. Right. When you look at that time, and I don't want to get into like, the civil war and all that kind of stuff like i don't want to make this a political thing but like the he was able to convey a message in such few amount of words like that talent doesn't like that doesn't exist in in our society today like i'd love to be able to sit down and be like how does your brain work to be able to have such profound messaging with you all know I talk way too much. If I could curb that down to the 300 words of the Gettysburg Address, that would probably benefit everybody in the space. <laughs> but yeah, it's always been Lincoln has always fascinated me. There's been a lot of good, a lot of good podcasts out around that that I've just, yeah, it's always fascinated me. So the Oliver Stone movie uh, was fantastic around that too, um, yeah. around Lincoln specifically as a yeah. So Wondery has a good. Uh, I think it's called 1886 or 1880 something or other. And it starts at Lincoln's assassination and what happened after that. Hmm. And those couple of weeks, those couple of months after that with Edward Stanton and the whole nine yards. And like, there's a lot of fascinating things that I'm sure people don't know. For example, Booth was secretly engaged to his daughter, right? There's just a lot like, what? Wait a minute. Is what wait what so this is it's anyways I find it very fascinating and just the nuance of of like life back then so so anyways uh here we are we're talking about everybody's fun words zero trust and you know if you're here listening to me it's probably because you have zero trust with me I'm kidding and so Queen why don't you take us <clears throat> through a little bit about what you're what you've done here what's going on with CompTIA and that kind of stuff please yeah so <clears throat> What I wanted to do after Tim asked me if I could come on and talk a little bit about the trust mark, I, I, I wanted to, because I know Zero Trust has been, Zero Trust has been out there for a couple of years now, right? Uh, everybody's been hearing the words, what does it mean? How do I implement it? We, heck, we even have some marketing teams that are touting that buy our product and you'll have Zero Trust, right? Um, so it, it, I, I, I just want to take a few minutes, kind of walk you through at least my perspective on Zero Trust. Um, and then how, how, what does this mean for what's next for the industry as a whole, right? So I'm talking specifically to the MSPs, solution providers, and then that doesn't mean if there's some other folks on outside of the MSP solution provider industry, you can take some of these things too, right? Uh, and, and move forward. I'm hoping everybody saw the cyber strategy for the U.S., right yeah. uh, oh my god that just came out like hours ago i had like 35 posts blowing up my linkedin feed and of course i had to add to it right <laughs> yeah so I, i'll give you some context before i actually get into this this whole conversation but i want to make sure that you i'm going to reiterate if you have any questions please ask tim just bug the heck out of him and he'll interrupt me i want this to be It'll make me work for it today huh? <laughs> yeah. well, of course man um um, so the last year I had the privilege of being able to go over and talk to the folks at the National Cybersecurity Center, um, and, and develop a, a relationship there. They invited me back in January. Uh, I also met with the policy making arm of the UK government, the, mm -hmm. and everybody's going to get a kick out of this one. So the folks that make the IT rules and policy over there is called the Department of Digital culture, media, and sport. And there's commas in between all those, by the way. <clears throat> That's a heck of an acronym. Up, up to the AM. Uh, yes, DCMS. 
Um, so I did meet with uh, with some pretty high level folks over there, and uh, they were actually telling me how they were actually they had actually structured some things to go into Parliament already last year, mm -hmm. which subsequently got pulled and is going back in for this fall. But MSPs are going to be regulated in the UK by the end of this year. Yep, no mistake about it, right? Um, We've the, said that how often now? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is no. This is really happening. They've already readjusted some things. I think based upon my conversation with them. But anyway, I digress. So the uh, uh, the EU is following very close behind. So just know, you know, at least from my perspective, because of my role, my very unique role here at CompTIA, um, I'm I'm planning on having some discussions there. We've already been engaged at the CISA level inside DHS, by the way. Uh, for those that of you that don't know that, um, we're also talking to some of the state governments too. Oh wait, state ramp? That's a thing. <laughs> oh, not state ramp. I didn't I say know. that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm um, just going to keep throwing out acronyms and big words that'll probably confuse most of the audience because that's what I do. Right. Yeah. No. For sure. But just know, you know. So what we're about, what what, what I'm going to start talking about here is actually going to become extremely relevant for everybody here in the U.S. It's already relevant for folks in the U.K soon to be EU, Australia, Asia Pacific Rim, doesn't matter where you are in the world. This is this is happening and it's gonna happen a lot faster, I think, than most organizations realize. And I don't think they're gonna go through the same hurdles that CMMC is still going through. So you I just know. said the four letter word. I know I did, darn it. Uh, uh, anyway, <clears throat> so let's get started, right? So zero trust, let's level set everybody real quick, right? So this is the definition from the National Institute of Standards, uh, Standards and Technology. I you will can tell say you, NIST, you're amongst friends. I know I am. I know I am. I, I'm prior military, so as am I. I, I don't like using acronyms unless I absolutely have to, just to avoid confusion. So so you've got you've got the Timism there, right? Because we play a little game on the webinars and things like this so that everybody has their coffee, right? Their non-alcoholic beverage, because you know I don't drink. And every time I use an acronym, but don't define it or quantify it, we all drink. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Smart, right? So, so really, this whole concept that we keep hearing about at all the conferences we go to around zero trust is really nothing more than that. It is a mindset, a strategy, uh, a concept, a theorem, mm -hmm. uh, and it's unique, right? Much like cybersecurity is a culture, a mindset, right? It's yeah. a strategy that you need to implement. It is not a tool. It is not a technology um, uh, in, in a tool in the sense of being a technology that can solve for what, what's really going on here. And it, zero trust in and of itself is actually a function inside of cybersecurity as a whole, right? So if you look at this definition, from NIST, who is, by the way, a global organization, even though it's referenced here in the US as part of our standards collection. Um, ISO just added some of the NIST cybersecurity framework stuff into their uh, framework, by the way, as a global standards body, just, just to put this uh, in perspective for folks. <clears throat> Zero trust is really there to help minimize the uncertainty, right? What we... We, we think of zero trust as, uh, I think in a lot of cases of, I don't know who you are and I don't trust you, but it goes beyond that. You know, I want you to think about this. I want you to look in the mirror real quickly, or if you're looking at your camera, look at your particular window. Zero trust also means that it, you cannot trust you. I want you to think about that for a second, right? Because... Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can actually spoof who you are today, right? I mean, <clears throat> we've already had deep fake videos. We have this, this new technology, uh, rapidly developing AI that's able to take a three second clip of your voice and turn it into a full conversation going forward. Oh, like chat GPT and Dolly well, and all the others that are out there. It's Dahlia, right? So, but, but, <clears throat> but the point here is, and one of the things I want everybody to remember here is you can be spooked. You yourself can be spooked. Team Tim. Oh. I see Tim Schneer is on here. Go team Tim, right? 
Right. <laughs> I definitely need to make some copies of me just to get more work done. And no, I can see don't Tom, need Tom any... Watson's in here twice, so it's already cloned him. Who who's with me? We don't need any more Tim Goldens. Um, one is enough, honestly. Tim. <laughs> sure. Um, but really, you, you know, I did put up this, I did put up this graphic because I thought it was kind of cute. Uh and it, you know, it, it does help give us some perspective and some grounding. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't trust anyone, believe anything today. Uh, and it's just like any other day, right? So today, tomorrow, yesterday, right? What we assume to be reality yesterday could have actually been the incident or compromise that we are not going to find until six months or a year down the road. Yeah, what do they say? The average uh, ransomware or whatever virus, whatever word you want to use, like sits in your network for 200 and some, some odd days before it's actually detonated or something like that. I remember reading a stat about that a long time ago. Yeah, there, there's, a, <clears throat> there's a couple of interesting stats depending upon how, uh, who you read and what they're actually looking for, right? Now, remember, there are compromises that have occurred that people still do not realize have occurred inside their environment, and they're not looking to blow you up. <clears throat> not everything is about ransom. Mm -hmm. Some of the things is about understanding who you are, who you work for, what you do, and the data you produce. Yeah, it's all about the data. It is really all about oops, all about the data. But let's 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 talk about now because I accidentally hit the enter button. It's all good. Let's Let's talk about your strategy, right? Because I think in a lot of cases, everybody on this call has created some type of a strategy for how they want to handle security inside their organization. Or at the very least, they're trying to come up with a way to be able to sell cybersecurity or security-like products mm. to their clients, right? And I'm going to tell you, until you change your culture, you're not going to succeed. And so, go I, I totally agree. In fact, I put this up on LinkedIn the other day. Like, you know, we talk a lot and, you know, CompTIA is great at the education space, right? The, the courses and the things that they provide there. And like, you know, that's my heart is to teach the next generation. But I put it up the other day, like MSPs face a cultural shift. While education is part of that cultural shift, it's not just how we think and operate, like you said in the beginning, but how we interact with our clients and asking them to make a cultural shift. Like it's a big deal. You know, with us, we started this back in 2006. So we were able to do this slowly over time. And now what we do in our MSP and in our clients in our work, it's just second nature. Yeah. And that cultural shift is huge and it's oh. hard for all of us. And, and, and again, remember, I started this conversation around the, the fact that zero trust and even cybersecurity is a culture change. It's a mm -hmm. mindset. It, it can develop into a, an effective strategy, right? But if you, haven't, if you haven't changed your perspective to look at things from a different lens, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out here, right? Okay. So everybody knows the three pillars of cybersecurity. Uh, 2FA, 2FA, and 3FA. No. I'm kidding. Go Close. <clears throat> people, process, and technology. No, right. no. People, process, and policy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got to throw in my mantra in there a little bit. Uh, no, I, I, I get it. But, but really, everybody, everybody does this backwards. Everybody starts with tech and tries to fit in the rest of the pillars, and it doesn't work that way. Doesn't. If you're if you're looking to drive more of a security first culture and mindset, you have to start with your people. Everything starts with your people, by the way. How many They're times like, have I said that on a webinar? <laughs> How many times have you said that on a webinar? Yeah, trust me, I know. And 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 sometimes it's it's difficult, right? Um, because it goes against the grain from what what the other marketing teams and some of the conferences and specifically the speakers at those conferences are trying to drive. But if you look at their underpinning message, they're all they, in my pers my opinion, my opinion, not this opinion, my opinion, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're looking to drive license revenue. 
Yeah, I mean, buy my tool, make millions on CMMC. Can I tell you how many of those specific exact wording emails right. I've gotten over the last several years? Correct. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. They're, they're looking for you to spend money. Um, and I'm just going to be flat out honest with you, right? Uh, some of you probably know me on this call. I'm very transparent. Yeah. So um, start with your people. Yeah. And I, I've actually I've actually got an, an, another five-part course that I'm putting together for the Trustmark on uh, building an effective risk management program in your business. So nice. that's going to be included. With seems, the trust seems we have some overlap there. Oh, well, I'm sure we do. <laughs> um, but, but really, <clears throat> the reason culture eats strategy for, for breakfast, and there's even a new book out strategy or culture eats strategy for lunch, because it's perpetual, right? Mm -hmm. It's grown up past eggs and bacon, and now we're on to the sandwiches and yeah. the salad bars. But, but really... When there's a disconnect between your strategy and your culture, the reason culture always wins is because that is the mindset people are in. They're not going to focus or refocus their attention on moving your strategy forward until you reframe that culture, right? Right. It's who you are at a core. You know, like I said earlier, we needed to, do, we needed to make that decision when we got that contract and it said... Adhere to 853, Rev 3 at the time, we had to make that decision. This little thing or us as a company, us as a culture. Right. And, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about today that are prominent and in our face didn't exist back then. So it was hard. However, you know, working with some of the some of the people in our peer group, and you know, obviously CompTIA, you just mentioned you were going to be rolling out some stuff like. It doesn't have to be hard or scary, no. right? And and there's guys like Wayne and myself and others that, you know, I can rattle off a dozen more names that are willing to help you bring that forward and establish a culture of cybersecurity first. Right, it, exactly. I, I couldn't have said that better, Tim, right? We, we at CompTIA are really here to help. And one of the reasons... I actually even considered applying for this position was having MJ talk to me a little bit about his vision for what he wanted me to do inside what was effectively his past role. Speaking and, of MJ, I just brought him up if he has anything he wants to add. Oh, um, nice. Perfect. Uh, I'm glad he's on. <clears throat> so you really, want, you really want me to talk? <laughs> no, well, you know, we could have probably just this. met at Starbucks since we're not far from each other. Right. We could have hosted this together. Oh, my goodness. You're like you're like one of my two favorite members who are within driving, like short driving distance. I know. I just hope I don't get pulled over by your daughter at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hope there's not a third member that's wondering, am I the odd person out now? Yeah. So, so Wayne, uh, MJ, thanks for joining us. You know, oh, to, thanks for doing this. Me and Wayne off because I mean, you're the big deal over there. I'm just well. I had to come to this webinar to to find out what he's really been up to. So, uh, right. you know, so, let me kick you. No, nope, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. No, I, I listen. Thank, thanks for doing this. Thanks for helping us get the message out. That's what it's all about. And and I can't say enough good things about Wayne and the work he's doing. He's really bringing, you know, he's bringing some incredible, incredible impact and benefit for our members. And and it's stuff that's really going to move the needle. And that look, that's what we're here for, right? We listen to our members. We we exist to serve our members. Um, you know, for those of us who don't know CompTIA, we're, we're a vendor neutral nonprofit trade association. This isn't about revenue for us. This is about relevance and impact. I can, I can assure you we make negative money <laughs> on our community activities and that's by design, right? That is by design. We're, we're, a, we're a very lucky organization in that we're a self-funded nonprofit and, and those investments mean something. And so, I don't want to chew up any more time. I'm just, I'm, I'm really thrilled with everything we have going on. And I appreciate folks like you giving us opportunities to help get that word out there. Yeah. Thanks, MJ. And thanks for that. And, you know, and I agree what we, you know, what you're doing here in the community, you know, it's what I, it's my, it's my life mantra. And it, that is take the stuff in Tim's brain or Wayne's or everybody else's and teach the next generation so that Wayne, MJ, and I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah well, thank you so well much. Said. I'm going to take this opportunity to just kind of look over at the Q&A. 
nobody's asking questions. So either we're doing a really good job explaining stuff or we're completely boring and people are off multitasking on other things. So feel free to jump a couple of questions in the Q&A over there and we can put either me or MJ or Wayne on the spot. So yeah, we like the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> I don't. Um, so, so back to how do you start building a culture? How do you start making a shift inside of your business? And one of the things, uh, actually, this came from the members themselves, right? Uh, we have a cybersecurity committee, uh, not only in North America, our North American community, we have a cyber committee in Benelux, UK and Ireland, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the new DOC region, which is Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure we're going to have uh, a, a new cybersecurity committee uh, when we launch. And, and but you have to say it properly. It's DOC. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you yeah. why I can't say that currently. Um, so, you so say it like a German. It's DOC. I, I trust yeah. me, you know, yes. <clears throat> and I've had, you know, and I've had the privilege to be part of that uh, that committee for this past year. And, you know, the work that we're doing over there, you know, Trustmark is just one piece of that. You know, we have a couple of different directives that we're looking at and, and being able to provide you, the IT people, like those in the trenches doing this day after day to provide you, you know, resources around that. You know, I'm really interested in the mental health piece that we're kind of looking at as well. So, mm. you know, having been having been part of this and, you know, had the, had the privilege to be part of it, I'm pretty excited to see what's going on. So, yeah, thank you for that, Tim, because uh, we really appreciate all of your help uh, and support on, on the councils too. Um, so before I get into this new trust mark i want to because some of you may rem remember recall comte actually had a security trust mark plus um which mm -hmm. is now our legacy uh business credential <clears throat> that started uh back in 2008 at comte um and it was really it utilized 18 or 19 of the controls within the cybersecurity framework i bring that up because this new program that uh, the members actually helped us uh, pull together that we're bringing into the community, again, as MJ mentioned, as a not-for-profit vendor neutral organization, we don't really have much skin except to help raise the awareness and understanding for all of the MSPs and solution providers, right? There's, there's the only benefit for us is seeing everybody else succeed. So, <clears throat> the the new program is completely revamped uh we we have a plethora of content mm. uh, to go along with the 19 functional categories the new basis uh foundational basis behind the trust mark is the center for internet security critical security controls so all 18 mm -hmm. believe it or not um and, and we've also pulled in some other industry framework controls because we're a global organization. So ISO 27000, there's 80171, which also refers obviously back to CMMC. Um, uh, uh, GDPR, HIPAA, mm -hmm. uh, some New York State Department of Financial Services. DYS, yeah. So, so I can actually talk a lot about this. You know, having served on the committee that built the framework this past summer, you know, in our peer group, I've heard a lot of people say like, you know, there's lots of controls. It can be hard. It can be daunting. It can be all of this stuff. And, you know, the truth be told, a lot of the things that are in there, you probably are already doing, you might just not know it, right? And so when we, you know, when we looked at building out the control list and the framework and how it's iterative over time, much like CIS, like we took into consideration, you know, the, the, the one arm paper hanger that works out of the back of his car all the way up to the, you know, multi-billion dollar MSP with thousands of employees. We tried to make this obviously safe and secure, zero trust, all the fun things that we just talked about, but we also tried to make sure it would be obtainable to you. Like something that is a goal that you could actually achieve 
And what CompTIA is trying to do is to make sure that you are successful at this because bettering yourself, bettering your, M is that a word, bettering? Improving yourself and improving your MSP and your posture and your defensibility and all those other fun words, like it's only going to help the industry as a whole, right? I mean, let's face it. There's a bunch of people that probably shouldn't be doing this work. I was one of them until I made that shift years ago. But, you know, the framework doesn't have to be scary, right? The controls are probably things you're already doing. You're probably already familiar with right now. Yeah, that's a that's a super important point. And, and you know, I... My MSP, so for those who don't know me, I, I ran a small MSP up in Tim's neck of the woods. Um, Tim and I actually first met when I was running that MSP. And say, was, truth, truth be told, I kicked him out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, I didn't kick him out. I just didn't need the services right then and there. You were very gentle about it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I got that original trust mark. I was the first one to get it. And, and I think your point there is really important because a lot of people talk about wanting to do the right thing and then they never follow through on it. And a lot of that is because there's this perception out there that it's incredibly difficult to achieve some of these things. But, you know, there, there are sort of two, two views on that, right? Anything that's worth getting requires a little elbow grease, right? You know, nothing's going to drop in your lap for, for just showing up and being a nice person. But the other side of it is it does need to be realistic and attainable. And, and Wayne's point about the different frameworks that we're mapping to, you know, we're not going to, we're not asking anyone to change their business. We're asking people to improve their business. And the work that Wayne is doing with some of the multi-character government agencies that he's mentioned and others is to ultimately get this trust mark recognized by these governments so that when they actually get some legislation across the finish line, right. there will be independent assets like the CompTIA cybersecurity trust mark that they can look to and say, you know what, if you've got this, you need our regulatory controls, whatever so, those may be. So, now, so that's so not so a guarantee. I want to, I just want to put the disclaimer on that. That's not yeah. a guarantee, but that's absolutely what we're aiming for. Right, and let's, and let's level set here real quick, right? So uh, everybody that's in participating, the 26 of you, there's a little like raise your hand thing in the bottom. Like, can we all agree that we know regulation is coming at some point? When and why, however it looks like, can we all just agree? I'll raise my hand virtually, physically. Can we agree that it's coming? Perfect. All right. So we got at least eight people that agreed with us, seven, eight, <laughs> nine, 10, they're growing. So we know it's coming, right? So there's a bunch of different things happening in the space, right? And who better than CompTIA, this global, massive IT focused organization to try to help us be successful when that stuff happens here, right? All right, so it seems like we have content consensus. I do have a quick question in chat. Let me look real quick. Uh, agree, Europe, GDPR. Is there actually a question in here? It's a long list. There's some good news. Most of the relevant, blah, 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 means of compliance. So I think what they're asking, um, and I'm not going to pronounce your name because I'll probably butcher it. So I'm sorry. I think what they're asking is like, in the absence of no globalized standard, we mm -hmm. have way too many standards, right? <laughs> right? And some of them do really good on technical. Some of them do really good on operational. None of them do all of it really well. Right. Unless, of course, you're FedRAMP I and you're taking all of the 853 controls, all 1,009 of them, and then you're still missing some pieces. <laughs> Yeah, so so let me address that really quick, right? Because uh, I I know we we go off on on some of these comments, but they're important to have as well. Um, but getting back to the trust mark, the goal here for the controls that were picked for this particular trust mark for at least us to start the initial ball rolling on industry accepted best practice, right? We're not calling this a framework. 
The goal here is to start raising the awareness an understanding of cybersecurity and how to properly implement it within your organization. And we're starting with the MSP. Now, some of you have probably already figured out, wow, so if I go through this process, what about my customer? Mm -hmm. Eventually, we actually see this moving downstream to your customer as well. It will happen naturally, right? So I talked about that culture shift. If once yep. that culture shift starts going starts happening inside your own organization, you're gonna find yourself having different conversations with your clients. Probably more um, proactive discussions with your clients and you're gonna find that it's easier to get them to adopt changes inside their environment faster because you're raising their awareness and understanding at the same time. So you, you used a very good word that I love, right? And it's it's proactive versus reactive, right? right? In society today, we don't have to train anybody to fill their gas tank, rotate their tires, get their oil change, their windshield wipers, do what we used to call in the army, PMCA, or preventative maintenance checks and services, right? We don't have to train anybody. They just know I'm supposed to get my oil changed. I'm supposed to put gas in my car. But they're like, we just, we, it's inherent to our culture. Right. Enabling 2FA, looking at zero trust, having documentation, it's not part of how we think, right? right. And so, yeah, I mean, CompTIA and all of us have shifting from that, oh my gosh, I got a flat tire, reactive to, oh my gosh, I should rotate my tires proactive. And in the cyberspace, enabling 2FA versus now I have a breach and taking that proactive approach. That's right. how we like to approach it as well, at least on MSP and here at Compliance Risk as well. Like it, it's, it's a lot easier to be proactive in, uh, in your approach with just about everything there are some instances where you will be reactive, however, like an incident response. However, you have already proactively been training and against tabletop exercises and other events like that happening. So you fine tuned your incident response plan. So your incident response, while it's reactive at the time, is really the culmination of all of the things, the preparation that you've put in, the planning you've put in, to deal with that and minimize the impact to the organization. So keep, yeah. keep those things in mind when we're, when we're talking about reactive. Yeah, I'm gonna do another little shameless plug. Like during our peer group, we do tabletop exercises. We walk through IR stuff. I mean, at one point, I think we did backdoors and breaches. Like that is part of the community, not just with us, but you as a community, like we doing these things internally, right? You know, my federal government client, we go through our tabletop exercises every quarter. And when you multiply that times multiple different entities that we work with, I'm literally doing a tabletop month after month after month, like it's a pain in the neck, but, but it builds that preparedness. Right, yeah. So, so this is the overall flow, right? So I wanted to, to kind of showcase so that folks can, we can take away some of the apprehension around things. We are very methodical in our process. We, we have a, matter of fact, we have a pre path before you even get into readiness, by the way, to help kind of prepare for what you're going to expect inside the, the readiness path as, as if you decide or if you're already signed up for the wait list, right? Oh, yeah. we, we want to help you get ready for the audit set, right? This isn't just throw you to the wolves do it or you're doomed kind of thing. As we mentioned oh. earlier, it's all around providing the help, guidance, and assistance. Oh, you... so, so, so you're starting with the people part, right? Are you ready? Do you have the people? Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Right. Con interesting concept there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you pointed that out, right? But, but really, the, 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 the way we have this structured is, is to help you baseline your organization. Figure out what are my gaps? Because in I will be honest, and I'm sure some of you are going to go, yeah, he's probably right. We don't know the gaps that exist inside of our environments today. Mm -hmm. And so understanding what those are 
we can then figure out what we need to do in order to shore up those gaps, minimize our risk exposure, right? Mm -hmm. Lower the overall impact. Now we're not touching likelihood. Notice I didn't, there's, cause there's two yeah. components of risk, likelihood mm -hmm. and impact. Can't touch likelihood. The likelihood is very probable, better than 99.9%. .9 at some point in your business history, you will experience a cyber incident or compromise. Let's hope it doesn't get to the level of a breach. But, but, but that's reality, right? And the same thing is true for your clients. The best we can ever hope for is to reduce the impact that that incident or compromise is going to have on our business. That is the best we can hope for. Right. And so we're going to help you get ready to go through this, right? So the ultimate end game, and I will tell you this flat out, this is not the stopping point for anybody. This is the on-ramp, if you will, onto the highway, right? Where we need to get you up to speed so that you can cruise along and go. Now, realize, of course, it's like being at a NASCAR race that's never ending, that's infinite. You're just going to be going around. There's, it's, it's a journey. It's not a, not a destination. Think of it as the sea brain, right? For those of you yeah. that are familiar with their old 24-hour uh, race, which was actually kind of fun. But so, yeah, I mean, think about like, everything that we hear is continuous monitoring, right? And that term popped up probably six or seven or eight years ago, continuous monitoring, right? And now it's prevalent everywhere, right? Well, it's not just continuous monitoring. It's continuous monitoring, alerting, reporting, and improvement. Yeah, um, I, yeah I mean, I dumped, I dumped it down to that phrase. I, I, I know, and I appreciate that. But there's four phases to the security journey. The last one never ends. The last one is continuous improvement in phase four. And mm -hmm. sometimes you can slip. Um, depending upon taking your eye off. Anyway, there's a, that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> but, but really, the goal here is to help you prepare for what's coming, whether it's regulation, maybe, hey, Wayne, I've got a, I've got a client that requires us to be ISO 27000 uh, compliant, certified, whatever the case may be, or uh, FFIEC if you're dealing with uh, bank structures or SOC 2 type 2, whatever oh, the case. You said it. Oh. Anyway, I, I my know. own personal beliefs on SOC team. No, I, I know. I, I'll, I can throw mine out there too. But, but that's actually becoming a pretty big buzzword within the industry as well. And if you're, if you're thinking about going down that path, question. reach out to me. I'll have a conversation with you uh, around SOC 2. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, but regardless, this is just to help you get ready for that regulation activity or moving into another framework. Hey, you know, Wayne, you, it looks like you got us better than half the way there for us to go up against the NIST cybersecurity framework. Great. Fantastic. Is that the right framework that is going to map to your business and to your business risk and to your objectives as an MSP? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you need to look at a different framework, right? Not all frameworks are created equal. Um, so just, just know that. Uh, and again, we can help you kind of figure out that, that path forward as well. Yeah. You know, we've had way too many conversations with a lot of, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens, probably not way more than you have, but they always ask what framework, where do I start? And I always answer with, I don't care, pick something and start someplace, right? right? Um, you know, the trust mark is one path for you to get there. You know, well, because, there are multiple different paths. Yeah, well- Just but, start. And, and we have a lot of information and a lot of content that can actually help you understand the why, mm -hmm. right? You're not gonna find that with, with a lot of the other frameworks. Yeah. The only other one that I'm, and they don't even call themselves a framework, by the way. I had this conversation uh, with Phyllis Lee. Um, they don't consider themselves a framework because they know that they're missing some components and that's the critical security controls. Yep. So, um, but they have a lot of content as well, right? Yeah. So, so just know that there's a lot of different areas that can actually help you move, get started and do things in the right sequence. Yeah. And the biggest thing is just start. Like you don't know where to start, like download an Excel spreadsheet as much as I hate them. Like ask questions, dump it on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever. We're here to help and help you get going. Like pick a place and go dedicate one hour once a week and go. 
Yeah, and so the other nice thing about the Trustmark is we actually have members on our vendor side that are helping the community of folks that are going to go through the Trustmark. We have. Wait, I'm not on that list. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> anyway, um, but but there are folks that uh, have you know provided a GRC tool as an example to be able to help you collect the evidence, see where you are. Uh, a couple of other organizations we're, we're working with and finalizing uh, to help you baseline your your existing environment today and give you give you that reference point so that you know what you need to tackle in order to be successful going through this maturity process as a as an organization. The the key differentiator that well, there's a couple of key differentiators, but the most important one that I think is vitally important to this new trust mark compared to what we were doing in the past is that we're going to have an oversight body, right? This accreditation board that is going to review stuff, keep up to date on the controls, right? Um, make sure that we're properly aligned still going forward into some of those other frameworks because a lot of the things, a lot of the places that we borrowed from they're up for renewal. So we have to change. We're going to end up changing some things. Do go I feel forward. like I'm getting voluntold to be on that? Uh, okay. <laughs> I think you volunteered. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, but you can see in here that we have, we have, we can at least accomplish biannual updates. And the nice thing about that is we can keep your organization moving forward and, and taking care of the, from a proactive stance, Rather than waiting for, I think CSF 2.0 is slated to come out in 2024. So that would be a six year gap from when 1.1 uh, was released, right? Just as an example. Um, so in this path, in this, in this flow, if you will, once you've gotten through the readiness side and made the determination, okay, I, I think I'm ready. I want to test the water, see where I am. And we can go through this self attestation path. There is a component to that which will be audited. So we will evaluate some of the evidence and have you upload evidence so that we can have a, a look and say, hey, this is good, but you could make this a little bit better. Or this missed the mark, you need to improve here, right? So there's, there's these touch points, if you will, to help ensure that your, your, your business is getting it the organization is moving, that things are getting implemented, and to what Tim said earlier, that continuous monitoring, alerting, and reporting is a whole section inside of our functional categories. I'll right? use Matt Lee's favorite term and coined defensibility. Well, maybe right, defensibility. Them, but, but defensibility and resilience, right? Yeah, for sure, right? It's Because it's important, right? You, you have, just because you put tools and technology in play, or even policies and process and procedure, you, you, I know, you have to make sure that you're measuring that those things are still effective and that they're being followed. If you're not, you've created more risk for the business. You haven't solved anything. You've made the problem worse, right? So, so that's, that's that, that path. You can see we kind of reference into cyber insurance. Our goal here is that uh, this, the insurance industry, and I'm sure if you've heard Wes up on stage uh, and read yep. Wetlock, right? Yep. Uh, uh, Wetlock, the, the, the industry itself is very slow in ad adopting actuary data around what's really going on. Has the organization actually implemented some of the things that we really want them to do? And is that what caused the incident or compromise, right? And, and you can see we have, I have that path going bi-directionally, right? Because we're gonna take some of that information and feed it up into those biannual updates. So maybe the controls aren't tight enough. Maybe we're missing a control, right? Maybe the insurance company says, hey, hey, you know, we're starting to see a trend here. We can actually react to that because the MSP solution provider industry might be, might be a target. And we can we can shore that up a lot faster. Well, we know they're a target. Well, we are. I know, I know. But I mean, specifically, credible intelligence. Yeah. Uh, credible threat intelligence around specific things, right? Yeah. 
So, you know, that's the self-attestation. Once you're granted acceptance in there, then it's prepping for getting the rest of the controls implemented within your organization, whether that's uh, additional uh, uh, programs that you have to put in place. Because again, you need to look at your people, you need to look at your process, and what you can't solve there with the control stack, you then have to look at your tech stack. And we're going to ask all of you to reevaluate your tech stack, right? And you're going to want to do that anyway, based upon the shift, the reframe reference that we're going to give you around risk. Right. Because there might be, you know, I'm very careful in calling out vendors, but I will use the the last pass scenario in this instance, right? Who would have thought? (laughs) Um, Actually, I did. Um, We all did. But, but so the, the, the one thing, if you take anything away from, from this session, the one thing that I'm going to share as part of the wisdom is you, there's, two, there's two major risk components inside your organization. It's your people, yes. It's your technology. Mm-hmm. Because it's what you don't know about that technology. And everybody, and I see all the chat things blow up. Oh my God, you know, somebody has a vulnerability. You should have already accounted for that, quite honestly. That was that goes all the way back to the risk, uh, uh, the 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 risk posturing that you should have done before you even brought that tech into your in, into your environment. Vendor due diligence. For those that are interested, I could share uh, when I post this out. We have a vendor d- due diligence forum on our uh, MSP's website. It's about seventy-eight questions. Yes, it's a it's a bear for vendors, and I don't necessarily anticipate every vendor that I work with to go through it. But like Wayne said in the beginning. I have my champion, I have my people. They're responsible to take this new thing, this culture, this whatever. And then we've defined our requirements and how we're going to use it, the process. Once we have our house in order, then we start running through vendors, right? On the MSP side. So so happy to share that. It's on Vital Tech's website. Um, You can go look at it. But Wayne, we're coming up here right on, you know, very close to the four o'clock hour. Yep. Uh, you know, you 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 shared two very solid points: your people, your process, and your policy uh, technology. Um, how do people look at? How do they get into the trust mark? How, like, what does this look like from from like? How do they move forward? Yeah, so it's it's real easy. So uh, uh, today uh, we are gathering names on a wait list. Um, for those of you that caught the Channel Pro announcement on December seventh. We started the wait list then. Uh, so this has been active for a while now. I will, tell you, I will tell you that the response has been completely overwhelming. Um, we have almost 400 organizations on the wait list today. That, in, that in, accounts for our pilot. Um, I told you we were taking a very methodical approach. We have a pilot group going through right now. We've started on the existing Trustmark Plus holders, which uh, encapsulate our beta program. And then um, after, uh, there's still some components we're, we're finalizing right now for next week for the launch. MJ and I will officially launch this next week, uh, this entire program next week. Um, week we, after. I'm sorry, the week after. Thank you. You're welcome. Two weeks. Uh, good, I have, I have a little more time. Don't rush me. Uh, <laughs> I know I was rushing me. Sorry. Um, uh, but but really, the we're going to start tackling the wait list in order that they were received. Right now, I will I will share with you. Don't get discouraged. We we've already started reaching out to some of the folks in the beta, and they're not ready. Um, so what happens is if you're if you're on the wait list and and you get notified from us. That we're, you know, if you're if you're ready, please let us know. If you're not ready, please let us know. Um, if you're ready, we will get you locked and loaded and into the program. If you're not ready, we will let you know. Uh, we'll put you down oh. at the bottom of the list. Oh, my MSP is ready. <laughs> um, right, um, and and that's not a that's not a negative thing. We just realize that some folks are ready, some folks are not. But we we also want to make sure that we keep this fair and equitable. Um, for those that believe that they're ready, 
um, we've actually had some folks that have gone, holy crap, we, we had some things happen. We're not going to be ready. We thought we wanted to do this. And we were like, are you sure? Is there anything we can do to help? You know, it's not like we're just, okay, kick you down. What, what can we help you with? And if they're still not ready, then, you know. Well, my, goal, my goal is to get to be the first one to get it in 2023. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little eager. Uh, no, so there was a okay. question. I think, I think McConnell, uh, Mc, uh, Kevin McDonald would, uh, would, would want to race you to the finish line there. But. Yeah, we can go. Anyways, there was a question that came up in chat, and I think it's actually a good one, right? So, so we, at least I, and we recognize, and the 400 plus recognize that this is something really good for us, right? Oh, QR code, none of my, I'm kidding. Um, we recognize that this is good for us, right? But one of the challenges that we foresee, especially those in the AU, like, brand recognition like how does this push out to our clients like what kind of i don't want to use the word sales enablement but how is comptia going to help like when i go to my fintech client and i say i got trust mark and they'll be like i don't care where's your hipaa right or where's your finred or where's your high trust right right, right. So that i think is going to be obviously a challenge for for this as well no, for sure, right? And and again, what I talked earlier about raising the awareness and understanding for your clients as well, right? Mm -hmm. It it's it's cybersecurity is a journey. Cybersecurity is not an easy button. It is not a checklist. It is not a hurry up and slam something in. You actually create more risk for yourself and for them in doing so, right? Which is part of the challenges around. Well, there's other challenges too around. Mm -hmm. so. Um, but uh, my my comment back to those kind of clients would be, you, look, we have to take and we are taking a methodical approach with an organization who's been around for over 40 years providing individual certifications around A+, Network+, plus, Security+, plus. I could go on, right? And even the DOD recognizes the fact that CompTIA has the the chops to be able to put together programs and put together methodologies and programs to help us better ourselves and better you as a client. It's not, we're not saying we're not going down the high trust area. We're not going down a SOC 2 type 2. We're not going down an ISO 27,000. But there are fundamental things we need to make sure we have in place that have been audited and accredited to say, we're That's ready to move on to those next things, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, we're kidding ourselves, we're kidding our clients and nothing's ever going to change. Absolutely. Let me interject one other quick point on that. And that is, you know, I'll be very transparent here. We've had members come to us and say, you know, is CompTIA gonna have ads on TV? Are you gonna put it in, you know, the major, newspapers in the major markets are you going to take out billboards the answer is no we don't you know that costs way more money than people than have said we, that that's weird yeah that we've got but what we're going to do is we're going to equip our members and we're going to equip most maybe most importantly our vendor members so that they can push it into their partner communities as well with the talking points with the messaging with the collateral Mm -hmm. When I had my MSP, I used to every quarter download the latest CompTIA research and co-brand it because we let you do that. And I would say compliments of my MSP. And when I would sit down with my clients, I would say, see, Tim, if you hired me, you would have had this benefit. No, um, we used to sit down with our clients and I would say, look, this is third party, independent, neutral research from the industry trade association that we belong to. And it is a global industry trade association that represents everyone in the business of delivering technology solutions to the, the engine of the global economy. This validates some of the things that I've been talking to you about or what have you, whatever the case may be. We're going to equip those talking points to help you know how to talk to your customers about it so that they understand where this fits, right? So, um, that's the key. Right? So I make it very simple, right? And, I, and, and I'll say to a client, I'll say, 
go to Indeed and search for the word A plus or any of the other certifications that you guys offer over there. Search for that word and tell me how many thousands of jobs that come up looking for the certifications that you guys provide. If that isn't proof in the pudding that HRs of small mom and pop shops are looking for the things that you've provided for decades, this is just another iteration at a different level with way more weight and way more meaning. Yeah. I would so agree with that. We are at the four o'clock hour. Uh, MJ, do you have any parting gifts? I mean, words for anybody? And then we <laughs> do as well. Well, I, I, I wasn't expecting to talk, so I didn't I didn't come with anything prepared, but I'll just, you know, I'll just say, Tim, thank you very much for for your leadership, your volunteerism, Thanks. for helping us spread the word. You know, it's, it's individuals like you in the industry that that help make things better for everyone. And that's the key for for awesome. CompTIA. It's about making the industry better across the board and Absolutely. helping everyone be more successful. You know, the 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 rising tide floats all boats cliche applies but it's not a good cliche in these times with the uh, mm -hmm. rising sea levels and we got to come up with something better than that but the point is is still spot on so thanks to everyone who joined to learn about this you know reach out to Wayne and his team you won't find a more genuine group you know we are we are as transparent as they come all we ask is that if you engage with CompTIA you leave your logo and your ego outside and you come in to do what's best for the industry. You'll be amazed what comes back when you come in with that kind of an attitude. <laughs> so, so Wayne, any, any last words? And I've got a couple of things here in chat that I'll bring up here in a second. I'll, I'll start with, um, mm -hmm. we love the pillow behind you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Re re resting breach face. That's awesome. Uh, um, I might have those same pillows in my office, thanks to Wayne. <laughs> um, so, so David, one of our members asked, uh, you know, time involved, implement the whole nine yards. I'm going to actually answer that because my answer would be, it depends. How ready are you? But, you know, so, and David, we can talk a lot more about this in the peer group about the estimated amount of time involved to, to do Trustmark, to implement Trustmark. Um, Matt, one of our other members in our peer groups actually gone through it as well, the previous iteration. We can talk about that during our uh, during our peer group, unless Wayne or MJ has a response, which are probably would be, it depends. Well, it yeah, let me just say it, right, because you're recording this. So it, it really does depend, right? And, and Tim hit it right on the head with why, right? Everybody's risk is different. I don't care if you're an MSP, right down the street from another one, <laughs> different clients, different business objectives, um, different risk, right? So the depending upon your needs, you can get, and what you've already implemented, I think Tim brought that up earlier as well, you might be able to get something in there uh, faster. You might, it might take you a little longer on some of the other things, right? Um, I, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, one of the, the members that's currently going through thought they were going to be able to get it done in 30 days because they had everything together. And then when they looked at the controls, they were like, oh, crud. I did miss that. And it took them a couple of months, right? And so it's not that they couldn't get it done. It just, they, they, they missed something mm -hmm. that should have been part of. And they were like, yeah, that was a... Oof. Wow, that was a, a big one. We probably shouldn't have missed that, um, but we did, and they were able to get it done. And they'll probably uh, they'll probably be ready for their full audit, um, probably by the end of May. I think is the target for them. Nice. The first time we went through an eight hundred fifty three assessment back in a day, we thought we were ready. I spent the better part of a year changing our corporate culture, writing, getting things in place that did exist back then. And I thought I was ready. And then the first OAM or the first item that I got for a dig was you did not address flooding in your business. I live in New Hampshire. It doesn't flood here. <laughs> so, yes, uh, you know, to answer the question, how long does it take? It depends. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that. So uh, we're four minutes over. Um, 
Where are you going to be in the next couple of weeks? Where can we find you and MJ, CCF, or you know what's going on in the space? And we'll end on that note. Yeah, so MJ and I will both be at Communities and Councils Forum in Chicago, March 13th through the 15th. Um, you know, it's, again, I think I mentioned this at the top. Uh, I think it's our second largest conference um, that we have is CompTIA. And it really, it's all about getting the members in and engaging and putting together, you know, what, what are we going to, what are we going to work on uh, from a council or um, committee council kind of perspective to help the ind industry drive things forward. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, schedule totally messed me up, but I won't be there. Very what? I'm very disappointed. I like, like we can talk offline about, Time to go. about life. I could have you kidnapped. <laughs> Perfect. And deposited in Chicago. Perfect. <laughs> that might help. So um, anyways, uh, Wayne, MJ, thank you so much. Um, oh, wait, Tim, compliance as Tim, Tim Schner, right? Compliance as a service. Everybody loves the tools, but compliance hey. is not a toggle tool. I'm not even going to bother with answering that because it's Tim. <laughs> Team uh, Tim, we'll talk about that. We talked webinar. about that earlier today. We talked about that earlier. We'll today. talk about that in a webinar next week when we talk. Um, so thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, we Thanks really appreciate me, the feedback. We appreciate you, Wayne and MJ, what you're doing in the community. Um, you know, we're looking forward to really great things with the Trustmark program. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. I'm going to end the recording. Thank you. Thank you.